Meyer. Thank you very much. I'm really glad to be here this morning. We've been working real hard on some great stuff that we can't wait to share with you. So thank you for coming to WWDC 2008. Um, we've got a record 5,200 attendees here. We wish we could have had more, but we sold out. <laughs> so. I'm sorry for all those folks that didn't get a chance to be here, but we can't find a bigger venue than this. And uh, we're going to have a great week this week. 147 sessions, uh, 85 on the Mac, and 62 on the iPhone. So it's going to be packed. And uh, 169 hands-on labs, over 1,000 engineers on site this week. And we've got sessions on both iFund and Intel. I think they're Friday morning. So uh, we've got a wide variety of stuff for you this week. And uh, I think it's going to be one of the best WWDCs ever. So let's get started. Now, as you know, there's three parts to Apple now. The first part, of course, is the Mac. The second part is our music businesses, the iPod and iTunes. And the third part is now the iPhone. Now, I'm going to take this morning and talk about the iPhone, things related to the iPhone. And uh, to help me, I'm going to ask Scott Forrestal, our Senior Vice President of iPhone Software, and, of course, Phil Schiller, our Senior Vice President of Product Marketing, to help me with parts of this. And then, after lunch, Bertrand Sarlet, our Senior Vice President of OS X Software, is going to give you a peek at the next version of OS X called Snow Leopard. So we're very excited about this. So let's get going. Let's talk about iPhone. Well, the place to start is our new software, the iPhone 2.0 platform. This is a giant step forward from where we've been. And of course, it has the software development kit in it. We started a developer program. Uh, in, uh, in March, on March 6th, which is just 95 days ago. I'm pleased to report in those 95 days, we've had over a quarter million people download the free SDK where you can build apps right on your Mac and run them right on your Mac. We've had over 25,000 people apply to the paid developer program where you can uh, actually download the apps to your phone, try them on your phone, debug them on an iPhone. And unfortunately, we couldn't take everybody. Uh, so we admitted 4,000 people to the program. We've been getting tremendous feedback. And we'd like to thank everybody uh, that's been giving us this great feedback. So iPhone 2.0 software. There's three parts to it. Enterprise support, the SDK, and some new end user features. So let me start with the enterprise. As you know, this is what we've heard from all the customers. We'd like to be able to hook our iPhones up wirelessly to Microsoft Exchange. And we've done it, and we've built it in out of the box in iPhone 2.0 software. Push email, push contacts, push calendars, auto discovery, of your uh, Exchange servers, uh, global address lookups. You can look up addresses for anybody in the enterprise. And should you lose your phone, it can be remotely wiped. All of this stuff built in to iPhone 2.0 software. In addition, we've worked with Cisco to build in their secure VPN services right into iPhone 2.0, and all sorts of other network security that was demanded by the enterprise. As a matter of fact, Everything they've told us they wanted, we have built right into iPhone 2.0 software out of the box. Now, I told you we've had a beta program going. 
The enterprise has participated in that beta program. As a matter of fact, 35% of the Fortune 500 has participated in that beta program. 35% of the Fortune 500. The top five commercial banks, the top five securities firms, six of the seven top airlines, eight of the 10 top pharmaceutical companies, and eight of the 10 top entertainment companies. Not so bad. And we got great feedback from them. In addition to these Fortune 500 companies, we've had phenomenal participation from higher education. And uh, we've had pretty much who's who in higher education in the beta program, again, gotten fantastic feedback. So we made a video of some of these enterprise customers, and I'd love to show it to you now. So let's roll the video. To try and put a perspective on the size of the Disney IT environment, we've got roughly 55,000 desktops and laptops all around the world, uh, 1,500 business applications. Sunshine Nathan Rosenthal is a 101-year-old law firm with 14 offices nationally and in Europe. We have over 5 million searchable files, 30,000 pages on our intranet, and over a petabyte in our data center. We're not much different in the Army from any other large corporation, but we're one of the few that are exceedingly mobile, deploy all over the world, and have people shooting at us. When the 2.0 beta was announced, it was amazing how many people from the firm contacted me immediately uh, at press release and said, when can I have one? We've been testing the beta release for the last couple of months, and the software is there. We integrated it very quickly and easily into our network. We deployed seven applications within the first week, and today we have over 2,000 employees that are on the iPhone. Apple has thought about the fact that when you come into large enterprises, you can't always count on the legacy environment. The release 2.0 of the iPhone software is very well integrated with Microsoft uh, Exchange using ActiveSync, so we can do push email, we can do push calendaring. The push technology is really nice because it's transparent. I mean, I don't have to worry about it. I've never had a device that allowed me to view a Word file, an Excel file, or a PowerPoint presentation as easily as you can on an iPhone. I've got over two million users in my gal, probably the largest in the world. I've got to be able to find people regardless of where they are. And the ability to do that with the iPhone is great. With Safari, we can access our entire SharePoint environment. We can access over six million documents. We can look at uh, business development information. We could look at contacts within the firm, everything available remotely while you're on the road. We also have the ability through some of the VPN uh, software that's been embedded in the release 2.0 to securely get into our network using things like two-factor authentication, which again are very important from a, a security perspective. Genentech needs to protect its information. And with the new release, we have WPA, we have VPN, we have all the tools we need to really keep it secure. Our security team here at Sun and Shine works closely with the Secret Service, as well as uh, the Homeland Security Group, uh, Enfragard, and the FBI. So security and, and maintaining uh, those secrets for our clients is extremely important for us. To initiate the remote wipe ourselves is a great feature. I've got to make sure that I can secure that device, I can lock it down, or get rid of it, destroy it, and delete the information on it if I lose it. I'm talking about soldiers' lives. The addition of the 2.0 software, I think, is really going to change the game. The things that we said were most important for improving the iPhone in the corporate environment have been delivered in 2.0. We believe the iPhone is an enterprise-class mobile computing platform. It really has the ability to pack the power of a laptop into the size of a smartphone. So. That gives, you, that gives you a sense of what we're doing in the enterprise, all this stuff built right into iPhone 2.0 software. So next up is the SDK. And to take us through where we are with the SDK and to show us some really exciting stuff, I'd like to bring up Scott Forrestal. Scott? All yours.
All right. With the SDK in iPhone 2.0, we are opening up the same native APIs and tools that we use internally to build all of the applications that ship as part of the iPhone. That means that you, as a developer, can build applications for the iPhone the same way we do. Let's start by talking about the APIs. The APIs and the frameworks on the iPhone share extensively with those in Mac OS X. Starting with the CoreOS architectural layer, we actually use the exact same OS X kernel on the iPhone that forms the basis of Mac OS X. In fact, if you look at the APIs and the frameworks at this layer, almost all of them share line for line the same source code that we use for Mac OS X. We also have a comprehensive core services layer. It has everything from a complete database API with SQLite. And it has a really popular feature, which is core location. This allows you to easily build location-based services into your application. We've got a rich media layer. We have everything from three-dimensional positional audio with OpenAL all the way up to a hardware-accelerated, screaming-fast implementation of OpenGL ES for real-time 3D graphics. And we top it all off with Cocoa Touch. Cocoa Touch is our user interface, object-oriented framework. And this makes building an application for our full-screen touch interface an absolute breeze. So we have a great set of APIs. On top of this, we have a really powerful set of tools. We start with Xcode. Xcode is the tool you'll use to write your code, to edit it, and to debug it. We also have Interface Builder. Interface Builder allows you to easily construct your user interface and then to connect it directly to your code. We have an iPhone simulator. This allows you to run and debug your applications right on your Mac. And we go beyond that and make it trivial for you to debug your applications right on your iPhone as well, plugged into your Mac, running in Xcode. And our last tool is Instruments. This is a full suite of performance tools. It allows you to measure and optimize your application to get the absolute best performance out of it. Now, I'd like to demo these tools for you now. I don't have enough time to demo all of them, so what I really want to do is concentrate on how you construct your user interface in Interface Builder. We'll start here by launching Xcode. And I'm going to create a new project. This will just be a basic Cocoa Touch application, which I'm going to call Nearby Friends. All right, so Xcode has just created this new project. My application is going to use the built-in address book APIs so it can access the contacts database on the phone. It's also going to use the built-in core location APIs so I can add a location-based service. In my case, I'm going to filter be between showing all of the contacts and just those contacts within 10 miles of my current location. Now, since what I really want to show you is how to construct the user interface, I'm going to drag in the controller glue that's already written. This is around 300 lines of code that talks to those address book APIs and the core location APIs. All right, let's go ahead and build the user interface. This is Interface Builder. In the center, you'll see a window, which is the canvas on which we'll build our user interface. On the left-hand side, this is a library of all those Cocoa Touch controls. Let me go ahead and drag out a search field. Now, you can see the search bar automatically changes size to fit exactly perfectly for the iPhone. I'll drag out a toolbar for the bottom. Snaps right into place. This comes pre-populated with one item. I don't want to use that item. 
I actually want to use a segmented control. And this is the control I'll use to uh, switch between seeing all of my contacts and just my, my nearby ones. Now this is interesting. It has a couple different looks depending if it's in the content region or the toolbar. Interface Builder knows this and automatically gives it the right appearance. I'll say this was for all my contacts. This is for my nearby contacts. Now I want to center that uh, in the toolbar. This is incredibly easy in Interface Builder. It has great layout controls. So now I've centered it. In fact, I've centered it in such a way that even if the toolbar changes size, it'll stay centered in the, in the middle of the toolbar. Now you might ask, when would a toolbar change size on an iPhone? And the answer is, well, if you rotate from portrait to landscape, it changes size, and you notice we automatically keep that centered, and you can test all of that right from within Interface Builder. Now there's one more control I need, and that's to show all of my contacts. So I'll drag out a standard table view control, position it right in here, and we're good. So now I can actually simulate this interface. It loads it up in the iPhone simulator. You can see here's the table view, all the standard uh, behaviors. I can click between the buttons. And if I click in the search field, it automatically brings up the keyboard. The next step is to wire this up with my code. So I'll quit the simulator, go back to Interface Builder. The great thing about Interface Builder is it knows all about the code you're writing in Xcode. So I can actually tell if this is that nearby friends controller I dragged in earlier. And now I can tell if that right there is your search bar. This here, that's your table view where you should show uh, the contacts. And if someone taps on this control, go ahead and toggle your nearby friends. That's it. We're done. We've built the interface. We've wired it up to our, con to our code. And now with one click in Xcode, it runs the full application. These are now my real contacts. If I click in here, it brings up the keyboard. And if I type something, say, Bill, it filters right down to Bill Campbell. That's how easy it is to write an application and test it in the simulator right here on your Mac. Now let me take it one step further, which is I have an iPhone plugged into the computer here, and I want to test it on my iPhone. That involves only changing one pop-up. I'll change that to say build for the, for the iPhone. One click, build and go. It's now compiling that same application, packaging it up. It uh, signs it correctly for my development environment, for my development device, brings it up on here. It's launching it, connecting the debugger. So now I can use my finger to go ahead and swipe through. I could tap in the search field. Let's say I'll type uh, Bill again, filters down. I can clear that out. And I'm just going to tap on nearby. And using location-based services, it found my current location and filtered it to only contacts within 10 miles of my present location. And of course, using the accelerometer, I can turn this to landscape. It rotates the application. And you notice that control at the bottom stays centered. So this is how easy it is to build applications for the iPhone. We have got just a great set of APIs and a really powerful set of tools. Now, this has been out for uh, you know, about three months. And there are thousands of developers out there using it. And so we asked them, what do they think about uh, the SDK so far? And the responses were unbelievably positive. So let me go ahead and read you some of their quotes. This one comes from Jonathan Backer at Walt Disney. He said, after working with hundreds of other mobile devices, developing for the iPhone is a breath of fresh air. The hardware is stable and full-featured, while the software development tools are intuitive and represent a level of polish rarely seen in the mobile arena. Next, I have coded fairly extensively with Symbian, Windows Mobile, 
and BlackBerry. iPhone just blows them away, making me wonder who decided that mobile development had to be difficult? From Tom Yeager at InfoWorld. The next, we really like the Xcode development environment. It blows away everything we've worked with from RIM. Elias Slater, Director of Mobile Product Development at Fox Interactive Media. And David Pogue of the New York Times has a really nice way of summing it all up. He writes, you're witnessing the birth of a third major computer platform, Windows, Mac OS X, iPhone. So we couldn't agree more. We think we have just a fantastic platform here for people to build incredible applications. And there have been thousands of people in the last few months, even on our beta, already building applications. And we've started to see some of these. And we were really amazed with the quality of these applications. And so we decided to invite a number of these developers up here today to show you what they've created. The first developer I'd like to invite up is one that was with us back when we launched the beta in March. And it's Sega. In March, Sega blew us away with what they had accomplished in just two weeks, bringing up the first cut of Super Monkey Ball. What they have done in the few months since then to polish it and get it ready for market is absolutely astounding. And to walk you through their experiences with the SDK, I'd like to invite up Ethan Einhorn. Ethan? Thanks, Scott. Joining us on stage today is fellow Sega producer Josh Morton to drive. So back when we showed you Super Monkey Ball on the iPhone for the first time last March, our development team, Other Ocean, were able to create four stages from scratch in just two weeks of development time. Eight weeks after that event, they were able to give us 110 stages for the finished game, which is a tremendous amount of content for a handheld game. They were also able to give us all four of the classic monkeys. So we have Ai Ai, Mimi, Baby, and Gan Gan. <laughs> Today we're gonna play as Baby. There are five distinct worlds to play in, and last time we showed you the first world, Monkey Island. This time, we're showing you the last world, Space Case. And the reason I want to show you that is because it's a terrific opportunity to demonstrate just how well the tilt control can keep up with the game's most intricate challenges. As you can see, this is a pretty tricky stage that Josh is trying to get through. And to be able to do it, he has to be able to accelerate, decelerate, and turn with pinpoint precision. The iPhone's accelerometers gives him the ability to do that. <laughs> so as a producer, the best part of working on this game has been to put the game in people's hands for the first time who've never played it, because it's just instantly fun. The tilt control works beautifully. It's a fantastic gaming experience. For Sega, the App Store represents an amazing opportunity because we can now be in the same place where people are buying their music and movies, and they can take all that content with them wherever they go. We love what we've been able to do with Super Monkey Ball. We can't wait to see what's possible with our other marquee characters. And this game is going to be available at the launch of the App Store for $9.99. Awesome, thanks. Productivity deteriorates. Uh, <laughs> I know that all of my QA folks love the game. Next up is eBay. eBay is the largest online marketplace in the world with approximately 84 million active users. And to walk you through their experience, building a native application for the iPhone, I'd like to invite up Ken Sun. Ken? Thanks, Scott. We also have my colleague, Alan Lewis, who's going to be driving today. And we're here to show you auctions on the iPhone. 
So the iPhone has quickly become the number one mobile device for accessing eBay. And while the Safari experience is great, we wanted to bring the best possible mobile experience to our customers. So five weeks ago, we decided to create this application. And the ease of developing with the iPhone SDK allows us to rapidly integrate with eBay's web services. So you can see here we're on the home screen. You've got easy access to search. We show the user's personal avatar and a summary of their activity. Whether you're a buyer or a seller, you can easily see if you're winning or losing and how much you've been selling. So let's search for the new Wii Fit, one of the hottest selling items on eBay, and add it to our watch list. These are all live listings you're going to see running on eBay's production servers. You just touch on an item to bring up the details. You can see the picture, all the bid amounts, and everything like that. If the buyer wants to see more information, we've also integrated WebKit into the application so they can view the seller's HTML description. Going back, it's just one easy touch to add this to our watch list. And if we go back to the home screen, let it refresh, we now see we're watching one additional item. But we've also been outbid on something. Just touch there, and it'll pop us over to my eBay where we can get more details. Here are the red and green bid amounts. Let us see what we're winning or losing. Let's try to lo win that item that we're currently losing by placing a higher bid. Bidding's really easy. Just enter in your bid amount, confirm it, and the bid is instantly placed on our system. The confirmation screen slides in, and hey, it looks like we're back in the lead. Finally, I'd like to take a look at one last item on my watch list. It's a $12.5 million home and golf course in Mexico. <laughs> Let's take a look at the photos to see if it's really worth it. So here, the film strip viewer allows us to see all of the photos. We can scroll through them. We can zoom in and out using the standard touch controls to see more details. Looks pretty nice, but I don't think I'm going to place a bid on it. <laughs> That's it for our demo. It's been a great experience developing for the iPhone. The eBay app will be available for free when the App Store launches. Thank you, and happy bidding. Thanks, Ken. Next is Looped. When we added core location to the iPhone SDK, we couldn't wait to see what sorts of location-based applications it would enable. Well, if you take location and add to it a social network, you've got something really interesting. You've got Looped. And to talk about that, I'd like to invite up Sam Altman. Sam? Thanks, Scott. We are incredibly psyched about Looped on the iPhone. Looped is about connecting with people on the go, which is, after all, the main reason you have a phone. We show you where people are, what they're doing, and what cool places are around you. The orange pin up there is where I am right now, and the blue pins represent my friends. We make serendipity happen. It's amazing how often you're at a restaurant a couple of blocks away from a friend or stuck in an airport with an old classmate and don't know about it. We'll show you that. This is the best version of Loop that we have ever made, uh, and by far the best device we've ever had the opportunity to work with. We've developed for nearly every mobile platform out there. This one is the best and the most powerful. So James is navigating the map just like you'd expect, by pinching and dragging and tapping. And we can see that there are some friends down south. A friend of mine is driving across the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, and here are some friends that are very nearby us right now. We can tap the map a few times to zoom in. Uh, and as we zoom in, we see that there's one friend very, very close. So we can tap on that uh, dot, and it's Aaron Easter. And she's only a few blocks away. And so we can see what she's been doing today. This is called her journal. Photos she's taken, text she's entered. All of this tied to places and shareable with any other service she'd like. And the thing in blue is a comment that her friend has left earlier today. So we can tap on that top entry that says back at the cutest little cafe. Uh, and we can tap on it again, and that photo will enlarge. So that does actually look pretty cool. And I don't have lunch plans today, so we'll see if she's free. So we can go back. I could call her or I could text her. We integrate with the native iPhone APIs. But I'll leave a comment. Uh, and I'll say, free for lunch. If she is free, then I can get directions to her in one click and one line of code, another example of the power of the SDK. And this is really all an example of the power of location. Location plus a contact list and information about cool places means you never have to eat lunch alone again or at a bad place. And we think that's really cool. We really do. Um, you can use Loop with your friends on most other carriers or devices in the US. We are the largest social mapping service in the world. And very happy to announce that Loop will be free on the iPhone and in the App Store at launch. Anyway, we think this is a new era of mobile. We're thrilled to be part of it. Thanks very much. Thanks, thanks.
Next is TypePad. TypePad is a great mobile blogging application that's native for the iPhone. And to talk you through their experiences with the SDK, I'd like to invite up Michael Sippy. Michael? Thanks, Scott. With me today is, uh, is Ray Marshall. Ray is our engineering manager for all of our mobile applications development. TypePad is the largest professional blogging service in the world. Every month, more than 100 million people visit a blog that's powered by TypePad, and photo blogging is one of our most popular features. Let me show you TypePad on the iPhone. So this is the application's home screen, and from here it's incredibly easy for me to post to my blog. I can create a simple text post by tapping Create a Post, and that brings up our post editor. Or I could choose to blog the moment by taking a photo and sending it directly to my blog. This takes advantage of the camera API in the iPhone SDK. But what I want to do today is actually blog a photo that I took yesterday. A group of folks were visiting San Francisco from our Paris office, and I took them down to Fisherman's Wharf. So I'll tap on Add a Photo. This will let me browse my photo albums, and I'll go to the Trip to San Francisco album, and I'll pick that, post, that first photo there. I can move and scale it to make it fit just right for my blog, and I'll tap Choose to select it. This brings me to my post editor. Now I'll tap to change the blog that I want to post it to. My default is Michael's blog, but I want to put this in Traveling California, which is where I blog about all of my adventures in the Golden State. I'll tap to add a title, and uh, we'll just call this Wow. I can tap to choose categories to put it in the right place in my blog's archives. We'll pick Bay Area and Food and Drink. And now finally, I'll tap to add some uh, body text and some commentary for the post, and we'll just say Yum. So I tap Publish, and TypePad for iPhone instantly starts sending the post and the photo up to my blog and returns me to the application's home screen. I'll tap on the Pending Items view to watch our progress. And in the meantime, I'd actually go and create a new post if I wanted to. But there, we just got an alert to let us know that the post has been published. We'll tap on the View button. That'll launch Safari and take us right to the post that we've just created, and it's available for the world to see. And that's how easy it is to blog with TypePad on the iPhone. We're really excited about the iPhone SDK. Made it incredibly easy for us to develop this mobile application. And we're also excited to announce that the app will be available for free at the launch of the iPhone App Store, which we believe will be the best way for users to get applications on their mobile device. Thanks very much for having us. Thanks, Thanks Scott. Yeah. Next is the Associated Press. The Associated Press is a cooperative of over 5,000 news organizations. And they provide the news to more than half the world's population every day. Now, they already have one of the best web applications for the iPhone. But they're taking it to the next level by building a native application. This allows them to take advantage of some features that are unique to the native SDK. To tell you about their experiences with the SDK, I'd like to invite up Benjamin Moss. Benjamin? Thanks, Scott. For us, the iPhone has been an important catalyst in creating a new network that will combine sources from thousands of news organizations. We've been reusing the SDK for a while now, and I'm excited to show you what we built. We call it the Mobile News Network. Local news from trusted sources is really important. Here, you can add all the locations you want, but the great thing about the iPhone is it always knows where you are. And so I've used the location APIs to automatically retrieve local news from seven sources here in the Bay Area. All the content is stored and cached and seamlessly updated in the background, so you can stay up to date even if you're out of network, like on a plane or in a subway. In addition to local news, you can also read top sports, business, technology, and entertainment news. We love how we can showcase our award-winning photography on the iPhone's high-res screen. I mean, look at that. Isn't that amazing? You can also watch great video from our news network. I'm very... Um not only can you be the first to share stories with your friends by text and email, but we encourage you to get involved in reporting the news you see. So if you have a photograph or a first-hand account of a breaking news story, 
you can send it to us immediately from your iPhone. We've loved working for the iPhone. The SDK, since it's based on OS X, feels like a desktop development environment, which has helped us transition and get up to speed really quickly. Hands down, it's the most feature-rich mobile platform going. But what's really impressed me is how fast my team's been able to build this, all in a few weeks. So thank you, Apple, for the opportunity to be here. Look for the mobile news network on the App Store when it launches. It'll be a free download. And stay tuned. We're already working on more exciting ideas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Pangea Software. Pangea is a longtime Mac game developer. And they managed to port on the beta SDK not just one, but two games, which are absolutely fantastic. To walk you through it, I'd like to invite up Brian Greenstone. Brian? Thank you, Scott. Good morning, everybody. Well, I'm really excited today to be able to show you guys two games that we've ported from Mac OS X over to the iPhone, and in the process of which we've made both games even better than they originally were. The first one is Enigma. Now, Enigma is a physics-based puzzle game. The basic concept here is you're trying to get the falling water droplets into the container. Now, the game is completely touch-based. So we use the touch to drag our puzzle piece down over here. We use the touch for zooming in and out. We use the touch for panning around. And most importantly of all, we use the touch for rotating. So in this case, we do a little rotation, get the uh, water droplets in there. And obviously, this is a very simple level. It's level one. Once we get 40 droplets in there, we get to move on to the next level. Uh, the game has 50 levels. They get pretty complicated. The puzzles are very large. Uh, there are force fields and switches and all sorts of things you have to do. But I want to show you guys something interesting on level two. If I take this part, I'll just kind of move it over here and just get a bunch of stuff firing all over the place. This is extremely CPU intensive stuff to do. We're doing hundreds, if not thousands, on, especially on the higher levels, of polygon accurate collision tests every single frame. Uh, and it requires a good CPU to do that. And we have a great CPU here in the iPhone. Uh, this version of Enigma is fantastic. It really is better than the original, and we're very happy with it. Now, the second game I want to show you is Chromag Rally. Chromag Rally is a 3D caveman racing game. And there are nine different tracks to choose from, uh, all sorts of good ones here. Uh, this one's one of my favorite, but we're actually going today to do glaciers. And we also have 10 different cars to choose from. Actually, we have 11 cars if you include the submarine on the Atlantis level. Uh, the car that is good for the glacier level is this one. And we can choose our character. Now, porting the games over, both Enigma and Chromag Rally to the iPhone, was actually very easy. It only took about three days to get each game up and running. And by up and running, I mean they were playable. All, all the levels were playable. Whoa. Now, the great thing about Chromag Rally, what really makes it a superb iPhone game, is the fact that the iPhone itself is the steering wheel. So if I turn the iPhone right, the car goes right. If I turn the car left, the car goes left. Uh, that's really, you know, that just makes this game what it is. And every time someone plays this for the first time, they just start laughing because it's a whole new kind of driving experience to play a game where the device is the controller. Uh, the SDK to do all this was fantastic. It, you know, like I say, it took no time to do, and that's really thanks to the APIs, the documentation, and especially the tools. Uh, even adding in the accelerometer-based steering took about five to 10 minutes. It was really, really simple to do, absolute no-brainer. So we're really excited to be able to say that we're gonna have Enigma and Chrome Egg Rally up on the App Store at launch for $9.99 each. Thank you very much. This next developer convinced me how even a solo developer can create an amazingly compelling application for the iPhone extremely quickly. He's actually a developer in the insurance industry in England. And the application you're about to see isn't anything you'd expect from someone in the insurance industry. <laughs> to tell you what his app is, I'd like to invite up Mark Terry. Mark. Thanks, 
Hi there. I've only been developing on the iPhone in my spare time, but the SDK is so easy to use, I've been able to come up with something pretty cool which I'd like to share with you today. The app's called Band, and it's a collection of virtual instruments that enables anyone, regardless of musical ability, to go beyond just listening to music on their iPhone to actually creating music themselves from scratch. So let's take a look at some of the instruments that Band has to offer. And first of all, we have a two octave piano. We also have an instrument called Funky Drummer that lets you mix up drum beats. The 12-bar uh, the blues instrument contains all the elements you need to play the blues in one simple interface. <laughs> And finally, for your backing tracks, we have a bass guitar. <laughs> We've only had time to show you a fraction of what band can do today. All these instruments and more can be recorded, overdubbed, and mixed together into a song. Or of course, you could always just get together with your friends for a jam, and maybe one day start your own band. Look out for Band in the App Store in a few weeks' time. Thank you. I think Mark must watch uh, the movie Office Space and just cry. I think he's in the wrong business. Uh, next is, is MLB.com. I'm sure for all of you baseball fans out there, you're going to love this application. MLB.com is the official website of Major League Baseball, and they've built a really nice application for the iPhone. To talk you through it, I'd like to invite up Jeremy Scher. Jeremy? Thanks, Scott. Hello. Joining me today is fellow developer Robert Spicala, and we are delighted to show you a brand new application that we've developed exclusively for the iPhone. It's called MLB.com at bat, and it has some features that we're not offering anywhere else. So let's just jump right in. Right away, you have all of today's games, live ones on top. If you want to get more information, just tap on one. Let's check out the Yankees game. Great. Now what you have on the bottom, you get a little more detail about the game. You see who's on base, who's batting, pitching, and the line score. This data updates all the time, so you're never behind what's going on. Now the next thing I want to talk about is what we're really excited about. This is what you can't find anywhere else. We decided to take advantage of the iPhone's media player and add real-time video highlights. At MLB.com, we edit video in real time for every game to make sure our fans don't miss a thing. And when you see the quality on the iPhone, you understand why it was an easy decision for us to make the iPhone the very first mobile device on which we've offered an application to feature video highlights. Now, these clips come to you minutes after the play. It's not after the game. It's right after it happens on the field. We also create reference movies on the fly to make sure you get the best possible video experience, whether you're on Wi-Fi or Edge. With the iPhone SDK, we were given great tools and a wonderful platform to create something that we think baseball fans are going to love really quickly. You won't find this application anywhere else, and you couldn't find a better device to experience it on. We'll be in the App Store when it launches, and thank you so much. We're so excited to be part of this event. Thank you. Thanks. Next, modality. You know, the medical community has really been flocking to the iPhone. Back in March, when we launched the beta of iPhone 2.0, we demonstrated Apocrates, which was incredibly well received. In fact, after that, Apocrates went and surveyed its key physicians and found that of those planning on buying a phone in the next 12 months, fully a third 
plan to buy an iPhone, making it their number one choice. Well, today, we have two more medical apps to show. The first, from Modality, is about creating more physicians. And to talk you through that, I'd like to invite up Dr. S. Mark Williams. Dr. Williams? Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Our lead developer, James Crouch, from the app, and I are thrilled to be here today to share with you one of our learning applications. So medical students typically rely on bulky paper flashcards and atlases to learn the complex names and locations of the structures of the human body. But this is about to change. We started with the gold standard in medical illustrations, the beautiful Netter collection. And using the iPhone SDK, we've created an app that is not only more portable, but also far more powerful than paper flashcards. So let's have a look. A student can easily find a region of the body and they view hundreds of anatomical images. Once they select one of those images, then they can easily zoom and pan across these beautiful and highly detailed images. Imagine doing this on any other mobile device. Simply select... <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> simply selecting a pen shows the anatomical structure, and it makes it very easy for a student to jump out to the web and find additional information on that particular part of the body. The app has a simple quiz mode that prompts the user to find a, a structure within an image and provides feedback about whether they're right or whether they're wrong. And we really believe that applications like this will provide unique and new opportunities for effective learning outside of the classroom. And I witnessed this firsthand in my teaching of brain anatomy when a student, after using a prototype of this application, said, Dr. Williams, I learned five new brain terms this morning while I was waiting in line for my latte. <laughs> so the iPhone SDK has enabled modality to provide learners instant access to the content that they trust on the device that they really want to carry. And it's been so easy to use and coupled with our business and development model, we've been able to produce numerous applications very quickly not only medical applications that we're talking about here today, but we're also bringing some of the biggest brands in, in K-12 education and consumer reference content. And we're excited to announce that within weeks of the App Store launching, we'll have a dozen applications available and many more by the end of the year. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Our next medical app is from Mim Vista. Mim Vista is a leading developer of innovative medical imaging software. And the application they're going to show just really demonstrates how absolutely incredible medical applications are going to be on the iPhone. To walk you through it, I'd like to invite up Mark Kane. Mark? Thank you, Scott. Medical imaging involves a lot of data and a lot of interaction. An interface is key to making it all possible. Before the iPhone, developing a mobile solution would have been virtually impossible, and the results kludgy. As we know from our existing customer base of radiologists and radiation oncologists, it's easy to be caught without access to a workstation, whether across the hospital, at the gas station, or at the golf course. Right now, we're moving through the slices of a fusion study with a one-finger slide, where we have a CT scan showing anatomic data and a PET scan showing metabolic activity. The two-finger slide changes the blending. Think of how a weather map works, where you have geographic data overlaid with temperature. We fuse the two together and present it as a multi-planar reconstruction. Tap view to change the viewing plane so that you can see the data from the bottom from the side, and from the front. Early on, we recognized the potential of the iPhone, and we set out to see if this was even possible. After one week, we had a prototype, a product definition, and the excitement propelled us through three more weeks in which Jeremy Brockway here said the SDK let his ideas just fall out without hindrance. Let's zoom in. We can use the pinch, the double tap, and then pan with one finger. Notice the scroll indicator along the right. This area is dedicated to scrolling through slices so that you can do that at any time. The swipe is the quick way to transition between volumes. And when you're viewing a single volume, 
the two finger slide changes the contrast, or window and level, an important tool for visualizing such a wide range of data. Let's look at the measurement tool. Touch and drag to position the start of a measurement line, and do the same to complete the line. And that line will remain on that slice until removed, which you can do with a shake. Finally, let's look at the MIP movie. This is a 3D reconstruction ideal for visualizing pet images. Let's change the color for this. Let's choose rainbow. Imagine a doctor sitting with her patient, sharing the images with him, iPhone to iPhone, or an oncologist interactively reviewing a radiation treatment plan. The iPhone has created a new direction for our company. We've taken a complex desktop application, removed it from the realm of black art, and placed it in the hands of physicians and patients. And we've only just scratched the surface. Look for MIM at the launch of the App Store. Thank you. Great, Stephanie. And our last application this morning comes from Digital Legends Entertainment. Now, we only learned about this last developer last week. They're based in Barcelona, Spain, and they only started on the SDK two weeks ago. But what they've been able to accomplish in two weeks building this game makes you forget you're watching it on a mobile device and think you're watching it on a game console. To walk you through it, I'd like to invite up Javier Carrillo Costa. Javier. We are an award winning mobile game developer. We're new to this platform. We're very excited to develop for the iPhone, as we believe it is a very capable gaming device. It has intuitive SDKs and tools that allows very straightforward development. We're happy to present Crawl, a fantasy action adventure game. We are our first contact with the iPhone SDK two weeks ago. It took only four days to port the game, and we used the rest of the time to implement iPhone specific features. We can see how Unai uses the accelerometer for the jump, how he uses the touch screen to move the character, hit the bat, or launch context based animation to cross the bridge. Our technology over OpenGL allow full 3D characters and environment with a quality often better than portable gaming device. Advanced skinning, dynamic shadow, and ambient occlusion contribute to the overall quality of the game. The App Store is so far the only marketplace where you can bring directly your content to the global market. Crawl is currently in production and is expected to be ready by September this year. Thank you. Thank you. So let me remind you, that was all running on an iPhone. <laughs> and they had two weeks. So clearly, we have just an incredible SDK. And one of the, the most fun parts about building a platform like iPhone 2.0 is getting to see the innovation that comes from our developers. And so I'd really like to give one more round of applause thanking all of our developers for their amazing work. So the developers really have been loving the SDK. Now there has been one feature request that doesn't currently exist in the SDK that a few developers have asked for. And the request has mainly come from developers of clients like instant messaging clients, where by their very nature, they want to get a notification even when the user isn't currently running the application. Another example would be, say, eBay that wants to alert you when you've been outbid, even if the user isn't currently running the application. So we absolutely want to solve this problem. The question is how. The wrong solution that some platforms jump to is to enable background processes. That is to say, 
to allow an application to continue to run even after the user thinks they've quit it. Now, this is bad for a number of reasons. First, battery life. That application that you think you've quit will continue to drain your battery in the background. The second is performance. When you're running an application, you want that foreground application to be as responsive as possible. But that background application, it's sucking up CPU cycles, making your entire experience feel sluggish. Now, other platforms have recognized this is an issue. And at least one platform has come up with this solution. <laughs> A task manager. Because, you know, like a game, it challenges the end user to brush off their computer science skills, <laughs> figure out which of those background processes is eating up your CPU, and then manually kill it. But don't kill the wrong one, because now you're in trouble. It's, this is nuts. Uh, <laughs> We have come up with a far better solution, and that is we are going to provide a push notification service to all developers. Here's how it works. Let's say you're running an application like an instant messaging application. As you run it, it's connected to your server, so you can send across whatever messages you want. But when the user quits the application, there's no longer this connection to the server. That is where the push notification service comes in. We will maintain a persistent IP connection right to the phone. So then the third party server can push the notifications at once through our service to your users. You can push three types of notifications. You can push badges, so you can alert the user how many messages, say, are waiting in your application. You can push a, a custom alert sounds. <laughs> These can be custom to your application. You can have as many as you want. You can push different ones for different alerts. And you can push custom textual alerts. They appear similar to the way our SMSs appear on the screen. So no matter what application you're in, you won't miss them. And you can provide buttons on them where if they're selected by the user, will automatically launch your application. And the great thing about this design is it scales. It scales to many third-party services. But still, there's only one persistent connection needed to the phone. So the push notification service. It is a unified push notification service for all developers. It preserves battery life. There aren't background processes draining your battery. It maintains performance. There aren't background processes chewing up your CPU cycles. And it all works over the air, over the Wi-Fi network and the cellular network. This will be available in September. But starting next month, we're going to be seeding developers so you can get your hands on it early. And this has been an update of the SDK. Thank you. Isn't that fantastic? <laughs> this is going to be great. So in addition to the enterprise support in the SDK, we have a few new features in the iPhone 2.0 software that I'd like to highlight for you as well. The first one is contact search. So in contacts, you can now just tap on search right at the top, type in a few characters, and instantly find who you're looking for. Contact search. The second is we've added full iWork document support. So you can now view iWork documents in iPhone, pages, numbers, and of course, Keynote. Great way to look at your iWork documents on the go. And we've completed the support of Microsoft Office documents too, right on the iPhone. We've had Word, and we've had Excel, and now we have PowerPoint too. So, It's super easy to download these documents as attachments and look at them right on your iPhone. We've also added bulk delete and move. So you can now 
pick a bunch of messages to delete, delete them all at once or move them all to a folder at once. It's, it's rather handy. And the ability to save images you might get in an email right to your photo library. Just tap on them and save them to your library. The calculator, we got some requests for a scientific calculator. So you just turn the calculator into landscape mode and it turns into a scientific calculator. We've added parental controls. Uh, some teenagers might not like this, but that's the way it's going to have to be. And uh, <laughs> so you can turn off explicit content. You can say, no more YouTube this month. Uh, no more buying stuff from the iTunes store or the App Store. And really importantly, uh, we've added a tremendous amount of language support. So in addition to English, we've added many, many languages around the world. And uh, some of the ones that we're most excited about, the Asian languages, we've added two forms of uh, uh, entry for Japanese and two forms of entry for Chinese, both simplified uh, and traditional, including one where you actually draw the character with your finger. And we have very sophisticated character recognition. So. We're going to be supporting all of these languages on the iPhone. And you can switch between them on the fly. So it's pretty cool. It's one of the great advantages of not having a bunch of plastic keys for your keyboard. <laughs> so, so these, these are some of the new features that we've got in the iPhone SDK. And together with the enterprise support, uh, and the SDK, we think the, the iPhone 2.0 software is going to be phenomenal and, again, raise us to a whole new level. iPhone 2.0 software, we're going to release it in early July. It is going to be a free software update for all iPhone owners. And we've gotten the price down to $9.95 for iPod Touch owners. So we're very, very excited about this. Now, one of the other aspects I'd like to talk about, which is intimately linked to this, of course, is we're going to have all these great apps. And how do we distribute them? We unveiled the App Store in March. It's phenomenal. It's going to be on every iPhone. It's a way for developers to reach every single user. And users can pick their apps and wirelessly download them right onto their phone automatically install them. It works seamlessly. And for those apps that you've bought, when there's an update, it will automatically tell you when there's an update. And you can download the update wirelessly as well. For developers, they set the price of their apps. They keep 70% of the revenues. We don't charge them any fees for credit cards or hosting or anything else. We fair play their apps so that they're secure and if they want to give them away for free, there's no charge to them whatsoever. So we think the App Store is going to be phenomenal for developers. Now, we've enlarged the scope of the App Store from the 22 countries it was going to be in. It's now going to be in 62 countries, where you're going to be able to access the App Store right on your iPhone. So almost anywhere in the world where there's an iPhone, you're going to be able to reach customers right on their phones. If your app is 10 megabytes or less, the user can download it over the cellular network, Wi-Fi, or iTunes. If your app is over 10 megabytes, they can download it on Wi-Fi or iTunes. So that's the App Store. We think there's never been anything like it to get apps from developers to users. But we got some other feedback that enterprises would like another way to distribute apps. They'd like to distribute them themselves just for their phones so that they couldn't run on anyone else's phones. And so we're actually enhancing the way you can distribute apps to add a way for enterprises to distribute apps. And here's how it works. <clears throat> an enterprise 
can authorize iPhones in their enterprise, a set of iPhones that are in their enterprise, and they can then create applications that only run on those phones. And they can distribute those applications on their own intranet any way they want, using any security they would like. And their users then download their, app, their apps onto the computer and sync them to the phone through iTunes. So we think we've got a great way for enterprises to deliver their custom apps just to their employees, just for running securely on their phones. But we're adding a third way to distribute apps. We call it ad hoc. Imagine if you're a university professor and you're teaching a class on how to write iPhone apps. You've got 50 students, and you want them to be able to mail their apps around back and forth, mail them to you. And wouldn't it be great if you could do that? Well, you can now with ad hoc distribution. What we're going to do is expand the developer certification program to up to 100 iPhones. And so you can get certified and register up to 100 iPhones, and then those apps can be mailed around, posted anywhere, and run on those up to 100 iPhones. Again, the users download them and sync them onto their phones through iTunes. So joining the App Store, we now have two additional ways for groups of users to distribute apps on their iPhone. And we think we've got a great story now. So that is the App Store. Now we've got something entirely new. And we're very, very excited about this. It's called Mobile Me, and I'm going to ask Phil Schiller to come on up and tell us all about it and give us a demo. Phil? Hi, Steve. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm really excited to be the first to tell you about this brand new service from Apple called Mobile Me. So, what is Mobile Me? In a simple idea, it's like having exchange for the rest of us. Not all of us work in large enterprises. Not all of us have exchange servers. But boy, would we like to have those capabilities. Well, now you can. With Mobile Me, we can all get push email, contacts, and calendars right to our devices. So everything is up to date wherever you are. So how does it work? Well, Mobile Me stores your information up in the cloud. So you can get to it from anywhere using any of your devices. If you're using a Mac, happen to use a PC, and most importantly, use one of our great new devices like an iPhone, it will push the information up and down on the fly to keep everything up to date all the time. So here's a simple example. I'm traveling around, an email gets sent to me in my mobile me account, it immediately gets pushed to all my devices. My phone, my computers all have the latest email. Or maybe I'm traveling around and I change an address book contact on my phone. It gets pushed up to mobile me and out to all my products as well. Maybe I'm working on a computer and I move a meeting around. The meeting gets pushed up to mobile me and down to all my devices. So wherever I am, everything's up to date. And the best part of this, it works over the air, wirelessly. Everything is kept up to date. So I'm out and about, I get an email message, I tap on my messages, push email, working on my iPhone, straight from mobile me. And it works built in with my contacts application on the iPhone. So if something changes, it gets pushed right into my iPhone and I see it immediately. It works directly with the calendar built into my iPhone. So calendar meeting changes, I get it pushed right over the air to my iPhone. So it is perfect for my iPhone. And of course, it works with the native applications I have on my Mac or PC. On the Mac, MobileMe works directly with the mail application, it works with iCal, it works with address book, so they all integrate with MobileMe. We've also made it work for PC users. So if they're using Outlook, to keep all their contacts and mail encounters, it works and integrates with MobileMe as well. You would expect that, of course. You'd expect that MobileMe would work with these native applications. 
What I think is really going to surprise people is we've built a suite of incredible Web 2.0 based applications using the latest AJAX technologies, and they're just amazing, giving a desktop like experience on the web. So, how does that work? Well, it's very simple. Go to any computer, any PC or Mac, open a browser, and just type this new address, me.com. Simple, easy to remember, me.com. And you get to this brand new website full of these incredible applications. You log in, and what you're going to find is this incredible rich email experience. Not what you're used to in a web-based email product. It feels like a desktop application. Now, right up on the top here, you see the navigation tools. That's how you switch between all the different applications. Just click on them. So I'm in mail, and I click on it, and then I'm brought into the contacts. All my contacts in the cloud, I'm getting direct access to them through this web-based application. I tap on the calendar, direct ac access to all of my calendar items stored up in the cloud. We've taken the gallery technology we had in Mac.com. That gallery now is built into a web-based gallery that any mobile me user can access and use and manage right here through their browser. And this is so cool. Just like mail and contacts and calendars, photos also work over the air with your iPhone. So I have this gallery where I store my favorite photos on the web. If I'm walking around with my iPhone and I take a great picture, I want to share it with all my family and friends, right from the iPhone with the 2.0 software, I can send that photo up to MobileMe. And it gets put right into my albums so that now I and my family and friends can all see it over this great web interface. And I've never gone back to a computer. I'm all doing it directly from the phone. And we've taken the IDIS technology that's been really popular and built that now in with a complete web interface so anybody can store their favorite documents and important uh, content up on the web and access it and share it with everyone right through a web interface. So it is a breakthrough web 2.0 application interface. What I'd like to do is show it to you right now. So I'm come over here to an iMac. I could run this on a Mac or PC. You might guess what my favorite is. And I'm going to launch my favorite browser, Safari, and just log right in. So this is MobileMe. Again, it's amazing to believe that this is in web 2.0 applications. I've got my whole mailbox set up, all my directories that I've set up, complete smooth environment, can read my emails. I'm going to select a few emails to file. Watch this. Again, you don't expect this from a web application. Drag and drop over to a folder. Feels just like a desktop application. <laughs> read emails. Sometimes good friends invite me to great events. So I get this invitation here. I can respond by just hitting, hitting a reply like you do an email normally. We have this cool little feature here, a quick reply, just right in line. I'm going to say, yes, love to go, and hit send. My response is sent off. It's just real fast, smooth, easy way to do email. So that's email in MobileMe. Now let's go over to contacts. Here's my contacts. You can scroll through them. It knows all about the different, um, different lists I've set up inside contacts. If I want to search. This is great, again, what you'd expect from a desktop application. I'm going to start typing in some letters, L-A-R-S. As I'm typing, I'm getting real time focusing down on the things I want, not what you'd expect in a web application. I can click on things like this address, and I get an embedded Google map right here built into the address book. It's so really powerful and simple. Next, the calendar, a rich calendar environment, get all the uh, popular views, I can look at it by day, by month. I like the week view best. And I can have all my personal calendars and items set up with color coding. I can turn them on or off, depending on what I want to do. What does it take to move meetings around on this web interface? Well, just like you would expect. I grab a meeting, I'm going to move this one to tomorrow and get it out of the way. Clear up my afternoon. Here's that gallery, this incredible gallery now built into a web interface. I can skim through photos, just like an iPhoto. I can click to go inside an album. Look how smooth this is. I'm going to change the sizes of the photos I want to look at on the web. 
want to move things around and reorganize my library, just drag and drop. Here's a photo that should be rotated. Just click and rotate it. And when I want to share this with my friends and family, here's the link right here. I can set it up, password protected or not. And here's iDisk. iDisk now has a complete online interface. This is really great because if I have a big file and I want to send it to someone, I don't have to email, I can just right here click share and you'll get a link to go get it whenever you want it without having to do big email files around. Now imagine I just walked up to any old computer, logged in, checked my mail, checked my calendar, I want to walk away, we've created this really nice little log off tool. It's a power on off button right here in the top right. You just know where to go, you log out, and I've logged out of Mobile Me on this computer. So for the next thing what I want to do is I want to show you a little bit of the interaction over the air between the iPhone and Mobile Me. So I'm going to come over here to an iPhone. I have one conveniently set up for you to see. I'm going to wake it up. Now you can imagine I'm out and about and somebody sends me an email. The emails will get pushed immediately to your phone using push technology. I tap on that email. There's that new email. Tap on it to read it. And so I got pushed this email. It's inviting me to lunch. You know how great email works on the iPhone if you have one. You can just tap on that link. That link will take me to Google Maps to show me where that restaurant is. You can tap on the blue button to get more information. I could call the restaurant right from here to make a reservation. I could go to their website with the Safari browser to check the menu. What I'm going to do now is save this for later on from when I need to go. So I'm going to create a new contact. So I tap create a new contact and save that to my contacts on my phone. So we just checked a pushed email and saved a contact on the phone. Let's go back to the computer. I'm going to log back into mobile me. And there's that email. The email that got pushed to the phone also got pushed to everywhere I access mobile me. And it's up here. It even has the correct state. It's already been read because I read it on the phone. More interesting, if I click on my contacts, there's that restaurant contact that I created on the phone. And the time it took me to switch between these, MobileMe already pushed the contact information that I created on the phone up to the cloud in the sky, and I get to it now in Safari, and it's all perfectly uh, in sync wherever I need it to be. Let's do one more thing with this. So here we are, back on the calendar, up in the cloud, and I just got that invitation to lunch. So how hard is it to create? A meeting, I'm just going to click and drag. I'm going to make a lunch meeting. It's like a really long lunch meeting. No. <laughs> Hang out with John. So I've just made a lunch meeting with John on my calendar up in the cloud. Let's go back to the iPhone. There we are. And I tap on my calendar. And you see the calendar item was already pushed from the cloud down to the phone. You can clap, it's okay. Now I'm gonna leave the phone up on the screen. You see it says lunch with John, I'm gonna leave it there. I'm gonna walk back here to the Mac. And there was a softball game scheduled for Wednesday. I'm gonna move that back to today because I just heard the softball game moved up. And in a second, you'll see it passed up through the cloud down to my iPhone. There it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you've seen it happen here. You're all my witnesses. It really works. We passed uh, the calendar item through the cloud down to the phone. And for my last trick, what I'd like to do is let's go into photos. I showed you the slide of this, but it's so incredible when you think about how powerful this is. I can be traveling around with the family on vacation, maybe at the beach, and take some great photo of someone, and I just want to make sure my parents back home can see it. Right here, inside the iPhone, in the photo application, I'm going to select Send to Mobile Me. Now, the iPhone knows not only that I have my Mobile Me address for my photos, it knows all the albums I've already set up. So I'm going to click At the Beach and it's going to create a special kind of email with the photo embedded directly address to go straight into my album in my gallery in MobileMe. And you can see the progress spinner. It's now sending that, and it's done. So my phone has just sent the photo up into the cloud. So we'll go back one more time to my iMac. I'm going to go over to my photo gallery. 
and go inside my albums, and there's that photo. Just got sent from the phone into the cloud. So that's Mobile Me. Mobile Me is an incredible new experience for all of your information. It keeps, it keeps everything up to date. It's like having exchange for the rest of us. We all can now have push, email, contacts, and calendars. It will work with whatever native applications you like to use on the Mac or a PC. And most excited for me is this incredible new web applications. Unlike any applications I've ever used before on the web, and it is the perfect companion for anyone who has an iPhone or iPod Touch. MobileMe is a service be available for $99 a year. That comes with 20 gigabytes of online storage for all that content. We think this is so amazing, we're gonna create a free trial, a 60-day free trial for people to try it out as they're gonna love it just as we do. It'll be available along with the iPhone 2.0 software in early July. Now you might be asking, well, what about .Mac? MobileMe replaces .Mac. All the, well, yeah, it is, it's, it's way better. <laughs> .Mac users can continue to use their .Mac service, they can continue to use the .Mac addresses, but they'll be automatically upgraded to MobileMe, can start using that service and switch over that namespace whenever they want. So that's MobileMe. Thank you very much. Isn't that great? We've been working on that for a while. I think we finally got it right. Now I'd like to talk, to some, talk about something that's near and dear to my heart, and uh, that's the iPhone. You know, in a few weeks, it's going to be iPhone's first birthday. We shipped our first iPhones on June 29th. And it was an amazing intro, certainly the most amazing one we've ever had. Uh, and iPhone has had tremendous uh, critical acclaim, best invention of the year, uh, and I think it's widely believed that this is the phone that has changed phones forever. So, that's all great. That's all great, but the thing that makes us the happiest is that users love their iPhones. <laughs> they love them. And, you know, 90% customer satisfaction. That's off the charts. I mean, what products today have 90% customer satisfaction? This is so wonderful. 98% are browsing. Mobile browsing's gone from nothing to 98% with the iPhone. Unbelievable. 94% are using email, 90% are using text messaging, and 80% are using 10 or more features. You can't even begin to figure out how to use 10 features on a normal phone. <laughs> so this is phenomenal. And in this first year, we have sold six million iPhones till we ran out some number of weeks ago. Six million iPhones. So we're pretty thrilled with this. Now, we did figure out what our next challenges are. The next mountain we have to climb to go to the next level. So what are these next challenges? First of all, 3G networking, faster networking. Second of all, enterprise support, as we've heard. Third, third-party application support. Fourth, we need to sell iPhone in more countries. How do we know this? Well, we've sold iPhone in six countries so far, but believe me, they're in use in many more countries. <laughs> They are in use all over the world. And uh, so it's clear there is a demand for iPhones in many more countries. And last but not least, everybody wants an iPhone, 
but we need to make it more affordable. And we know this because we go out and talk to people who didn't buy iPhones, and the number one reason by far they all want one is they just can't afford it. Some of them can't afford it. So we need to make the iPhone more affordable. So as we arrive at iPhone's first birthday, we're going to take it to the next level. And today, we're introducing the iPhone 3G. <laughs> We've learned so much with the first iPhone. We've taken everything we've learned and more, and we've created the iPhone 3G. And it's beautiful. This is what it looks like. <laughs> it's even thinner at the edges. It's really beautiful. It's got a full plastic back. It's really nice. Solid metal buttons. The same gorgeous 3.5 inch display. Camera, flush headphone jack, so you can use any headphones you like. <laughs> improved audio, dramatically improved audio. It's really, really great. And it feels even better in your hand, if you can believe it. It's really quite wonderful, the iPhone 3G. Now. How does the iPhone 3G tackle these things? Well, let's take a look. First of all, let's take a look at 3G. Why do you want 3G? Well, you want it for faster data downloads, right? And there's nowhere that you want faster data downloads more than the browser and downloading email attachments. So let's take a look at these first. First, the browser. We've taken an iPhone 3G and on the same phone in the same location, downloaded a website on Edge and downloaded the same website using 3G, and we've captured the videos. So let's see how we do. We're off to the races here. A website with a lot of images on it, complex layout. 21 seconds on 3G. All right, 59 seconds on edge. So same phone, same location, 3G 2.8 times faster. But it's even more remarkable when you take a look at this next to Wi-Fi. You can see that the 3G speeds are actually approaching Wi-Fi. This has been my experience using the phone as well. It's amazingly zippy. This is also pretty amazing. We took two other state-of-the-art 3G phones, downloaded the same web pages, and the iPhone 3G is 36% faster than the Nokia N95 or the Treo 750. So that's pretty cool. And look at the result, by the way. <laughs> look at what you get, a full web page on the iPhone and something quite a bit less on some of these other products. 36% faster. So now let's uh, look at a very typical scenario. You've got an email attachment you want to look at. You tap on it. Let's do the same thing here, same phone, same place. 
the 3G version downloads in five seconds. And the Edge version in 18 seconds. That is 3.6 times faster on the 3G version. So we can see a real difference now of download speeds. And again, if we compare this to Wi-Fi, you'll see that the 3G is approaching Wi-Fi speeds. So we clearly can get faster data. One of the things we're also really proud of, though, is we're doing this with great battery life. For the iPhone 3G, the battery life, the standby life, or the standby time, we've pushed to 300 hours of standby time. 2G talk time, we've been able to move up from 8 hours to 10 hours. On 2G talk time, these other, th or 3G talk time, excuse me, these other phones have 3G talk time in the 3 to 3.5 three hour range. We've managed to get five hours of 3G talk time, which is really an industry-leading amount of time. We're very pleased with this. Browsing, five to six hours of high-speed browsing. Video, seven hours. And audio, we've managed to get 24 hours of audio. So. Great performance, great battery life. Now, one other thing that benefits from fast data, of course, is GPS. And we've built that into the new iPhone 3G as well. So, as you know, location services is going to be a really big deal on the iPhone with the iPhone 2.0 software. You saw a bit of that here today. It's going to explode. And of course, we get data from cell towers, location data. We get location data from Wi-Fi. And now, we also get it from GPS. And using the GPS data, we can actually do tracking. So as an example here, we're going to drive down. We recorded this on Lombard Street. Lombard Street's a fun street in San Francisco that zigs and zags. And here we are driving down Lombard Street. And we can actually track as we move using GPS. <laughs> so it's kind of fun. You get the idea. <laughs> so built-in GPS and much, much faster data. So we think we can check off 3G and add built-in GPS to boot. OK. <laughs> Next, on to enterprise support, as we explained earlier, Full Microsoft Exchange support using ActiveSync built into iPhone 2.0 software. All of the secure VPN and the other security standards. Everything everybody's asked for built in. And we've gotten tremendous feedback from enterprise users that we are on exactly the right track. And we know we can now check off enterprise support. Third party applications, the SDK. The great tools, you saw the great apps, and we've got the best way to distribute them in the world. We think we can check off third-party application support. More countries. We distribute iPhone in six countries today. We set ourselves the goal of 12 countries for the iPhone 3G and a stretch goal of getting to 25 countries over the next several months. Well, how do we do? Let me show you. So here we go. These are the countries we've added.
so. 70 countries. We're going to be rolling out the iPhone 3G in 70 countries over the next several months. We're really thrilled with this. Next time you're in Malta and you need an iPhone 3G, <laughs> it'll be there for you. So again, North America, three primary countries. South and Central America, 15 countries. Europe, 29 countries, and Asia and Australia, eight countries. So we're really, really excited about this. And we've been working with these great carriers to get us into these countries. These deals are all signed, sealed, and delivered, and we'll begin executing them really soon. So our stretch goal was 25 countries. We're going to be in 70 countries this year. We think we can check off more countries. <laughs> Which brings us to more affordable. You know, the iPhone started off at $599 for an 8 gig iPhone. It now sells for $399 for an 8 gig iPhone. And we want to make it even more affordable. And I'm really happy to tell you that the iPhone 3G is going to sell for $199. At a hundred. At a hundred and at just hundred and ninety-nine dollars. We think the iPhone 3G is going to be affordable to almost everyone. And that's for the 8 gig model. The 16 gig model, just $299. And for the 16 gig model, we also have something special. We have a white one. It's also very beautiful. Very, very nice. But of course, the big news is $399 to $199. And we think we can check off more affordable. So 70 countries this year. We're going to start with 22 of the biggest. And we're going to be rolling out the iPhone 3G at the same time in all of these countries, and we're rolling it out on July 11th. <laughs> July 11th. And in almost every one of these countries, the price is a maximum of $199 all around the world. So we are really, really excited about the new iPhone 3G. And as you might expect, we have a new ad. So if you'd like to see it, I'd love to show it to you. Yeah? Let's go ahead and run the ad. It's finally here. The first phone to beat the iPhone. It surfs the web and downloads data twice as fast for half the price. Introducing the new iPhone 3G. Isn't that nice? You want to see that again? <laughs> Let's roll that again. I love this ad. It's finally here. The first phone to beat the iPhone. 
It surfs the web and downloads data twice as fast for half the price. Introducing the new iPhone 3G. All right. So, just like the first iPhone, this new iPhone 3G is one of the most amazing products I've ever had the privilege to be associated with. And uh, I'd like for Tony and his team who are here today, and all the ones back at the fort, and for Scott and his team that are here today to please stand up. Let's give them a round of applause. It's a great job. These guys right here. You know, we've got such incredibly talented people at Apple, and they put their heart and souls into these products. And I hope you can feel it. So the iPhone 3G, July 11th, 22 countries. And that's just the start. So WWDC 2008, I think it's going to be our best so far. 147 sessions, over 1,000 Apple engineers on site, wade into it. Take advantage of everything you can learn here, and go make some great products. So thank you very much. I'll see you this week. <laughs>